If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. All rise. Good afternoon. Please be seated. This is a matter of state versus Marvel. Good afternoon, Mr. Marvel. As I Good usually, afternoon. As I usually do, I want to make the offer to have you sit at the table if you're more comfortable. I know that normally uh, it is your belief that you are acquiescing jurisdiction if you come before it on this side of the gate. Uh, I will not recognize it that way, but if you would be more comfortable being able to put your papers out on that table, I would like to offer that up to you. I don't want any of my actions to presume to give you any jurisdiction, but I believe you have none. Okay. And I believe I have the necessary evidence here. So I don't want to do anything that would suggest that I am giving you jurisdiction because I am not. Okay, I understand that. And just for the record, before I give you the floor, uh, when we had a the case status hearing the last time you were here, you had raised some additional arguments or suggestions as to why you believe the court did not have jurisdiction. I recall that one of them in particular was citing that the court in the state or a corporation. So I indicated that prior to the trial date that's now scheduled, I will give you an opportunity to be heard on any additional uh, statements or arguments that you wish to make on why you believe the court doesn't have jurisdiction. So why don't you go right ahead? Well, I would like to review Article 15, which is the procedural due process that I have not seen take place here in all my other previous visits. So Article 15 is very specific as far as an accused is concerned. And it says, no subject shall be held to answer for any crime or offense until the same is fully and plainly, substantially and formally described to him, or be compelled to accuse or furnish evidence against himself. Every subject has the right to produce all proofs that may be favorable to himself, to meet the witnesses against him face to face, and to be fully heard in his defense by himself and counsel. I don't know who, and I told him this when I first came. I don't know why I'm here. I asked. I haven't been told. In fact, what I kept persisting you get out and walk out. That's not appropriate in my defense. I want to know who brought the claim against me. Who are they? Well, that brings up a good point. Are you saying that in how we recognize Article 15 is the first step would be when someone an accused is arraigned on the charge. And that is when the charge is read to them. And that is the notice of what the charge is that's been filed against them. So have you never had these charges read to you in court? I beg your pardon? Have you ever had the charges against you read in court? You gotta say that again. Okay. I, I had it. what? There are two charges that the Epsom Police Department- Yeah, there's two, yeah, those two charges that you have it. I looked them up at the RSAs. And it says, quote, if any person, blah, blah, blah. If any person, blah. I'm not a person. I submitted to you an oath of purgatory, which was filed by me under the authority of 15 Statutes of Life, Chapter 249, which is the right of expatriation and as an American, as an actual, that's what's entitled, rights of the American citizen. I'm an American citizen, I'm not a United States corporate slave. Can you explain to me what you see as the difference between those two? One is corporate jurisdiction. You're employed as an appointed employee of a corporation that is supposed to provide judicial services to the republic. And the corporation is the state of the The corporation is the state of New Hampshire. Right. And, and I happen to be an elected member of the board of directors of that corporation. And the corporation has part two as its charter. So part two of the New Hampshire Constitution is the charter of which I have to be on the Board of Directors of. Okay. And do you agree that the Board of Directors has the authority to enact laws? No, they don't enact laws. They enact public policy. 
The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Okay, when you say Constitution, are you talking about the federal Constitution or the New Hampshire Constitution? Both Constitution. Article 6 of the United States Constitution is the supremacy clause. It says all laws rules are made, are made pursuant to the Constitution. And the second mandate is, quote, the judges in every state are bound thereby. And the most important one is the third mandate in Article 6, which says very clearly, anything in the constitutional laws of the several states, guess what? If not in consequence, it's not enforceable. Anything in the constitutional laws of the several states, to the contrary, it's not withstanding. Can I go back to the question of the difference between an American citizen and a corporate citizen. Yes, so I understand that you're saying a corporate citizen is one who follows the board of directors public policy. Is that, am I understanding that piece? So what, okay, I, let's go backwards. What would you define an American citizen as? What I would do define as what? An American citizen. When you say you are an American citizen, how is that different from a corporate citizen? Oh, well, I mean, it's, not for me to define, but the United States Supreme Court has defined that. I'll give you the citation. Chisholm okay. versus Georgia. That's 2 U.S. 419 to 454. That's also in the lawyer's edition, 1 of 440. And Juliet versus Greenman. These are Supreme Court cases. 110 U.S. 421. That's the in legal thunder cases. The third one, American Banana versus United Fruit Company, 213 United States, 347. Hold on, what was that one? Pardon me? What was the site on that one, 247? That's American Banana Company versus United Fruit. Right. And that's in 213 United States or U.S., but page 347. And then the uh, definition of the United States, of course, is Hoover versus Allison and Company versus EFAT. And that is, 324 United States, uh, 652. And again, United States versus Crookshank defines the two, the two uh, classes of citizens. And that's in 92 US, page 544. That's where you get the definition. That's sovereignty. A sovereign, unless the sovereign is named in a public policy, he is excluded. And what do you mean by that? I don't understand. Well, your public, you public policy does not apply to the sovereign. And the you sovereign. See, Article 8 of the New Hampshire Constitution is very specific. It says all power residing in being derived, originally, being derived from the people. So all the magistrates and officers of government of the substitutes and agents and at all times accountable to them. So Pretty are, clear. Are you saying that the sovereign is the people? Absolutely. The no, the sovereign is the individual. Okay, so each individual, individual American. Each individual is a sovereign in of themselves? Absolutely. And that came about as a result of the revolution. When all feudal ties with the king of England were severed by the revolution. And so then you're saying that each sovereign does not have to abide by the public policy of the corporation of the state of New Hampshire? Absolutely, because there's no instrument. And what? The instrument, see, what occurred in 1966, I would put this before, what occurred in 1966 is Lyndon Baines Johnson exercised his will on the Congress to remove silver from circulation. When the silver was removed from circulation, Congress had to enact a means for commerce to continue. And what they did, they enacted public laws. The 89th Congress, they enacted public law 719. And 719 is what mandated that all commercial intercourse between government and the people had to follow the uniform commercial code. Why? Because there's no lawful money in circulation. You can't pay anybody anything. You can now discharge your obligations with commercial paper. Can I stop you with two questions? The 
first one is going back to something you said earlier, Rob, when you said there's no instrument to guide the sovereigns. Aren't the statutes of New Hampshire the instrument that guide the sovereigns in the state? The Uniform Commercial Code requires a contract, okay, an instrument. That's my second question. And it has to be fully informed. There has to be a meeting of the minds right. for the contract to exist. Okay, my question to you is, the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, is usually regarded in a commercial setting, obviously. And that was one of my questions I wrote after reading the uh, documents that you submitted. So am I to understand, and if I'm wrong, please stop me, but is your argument that any travel, anyone who's using a cart, a horse, a motor vehicle, that is traveling is part of commerce and not in their individual capacity, so that's why it's covered by the UCC? Absolutely, because the UCC is the controlling factor in everything today. Even why? Because there's no lawful money. Now, whenever, whenever you violate the UCC, you have committed a fraud against the people. So can you just help me understand your argument with how the UCC controls someone's driving in New Hampshire? Oh, well, let me do that right now. Then the Hampshire Supreme Court has already addressed that for you. What is it? What is it? Would you like to deliver the Supreme Court decision to it? Thank you. Or whatever. I want you to see, I, I, I don't know, I want you to read, but it's highlighted and also the red. Read it out loud so it goes into the court record, please. Well, it will be in the court record by your submitting it, and the attorney uh, will let. This is a copy of National Shaman Bank of Boston versus Jones. 108 New Hampshire 386 1967. All right, and I'm just reading what you have highlighted here. And this talks about secure transactions. Since the original purchaser of an automobile bought it for personal family purposes or household purposes, the automobile would be classified as consumer goods. So I understand your argument that the automobile is considered a consumer good under the UCC, but how is someone's privilege or right, depending on who, who you're talking to, to operate that motor vehicle? Well, you just were to me for interrupting, but you use the word operate. No, I mean travel. The right to travel existed before governments were incorporated. Uh, I have a brief on that if you were so inclined. Let me deliver it to you. Well, what is that? It's a brief on the right to travel All right. with the citations. And so are you saying that right, right to travel includes operating motor vehicles? No, use the word operating, no. Thank you. That has nothing to do. So you're talking about two different things. You're talking about I live for this way. Simply, a horse and a zebra, they're both equal, but they're different. You're talking about a motor vehicle and an automobile. An automobile, as the Supreme Court has confirmed, is not taxable. You don't have to pay any taxes to your town for an automobile. You do for a commercial motor vehicle. I have to tell you, it was killed last session. I put it in again, and I'm going to make an issue out of it. The automobile dealer today literally commits a criminal tort and the criminal court is conversion. Conversion is denying you the buyer from the certificate of origin, which is a deed to your property. The automobile dealer, because of coercion by a corporate entity known as the Motor Vehicle Department, which is a, is a private profit-making corporation providing administrative services, and your city is nothing more than a member of uh, that Motor Vehicle Department. I I'm still hung up on something that you said earlier. Okay. About travel versus operating. If someone's driving a car, all right, there's a motor vehicle that's on the on the street and it's being driven by someone. 
Are you saying that that person who's driving is just traveling through it? Uh, no, I'm not saying they're driving. They're traveling. Well, how how is it that someone? Are you saying that nobody's driving the car? The motor vehicle only has motor vehicle the product only has jurisdiction over the commercial traffic on a public way. Right. And so they have total jurisdiction there. They have no jurisdiction right. over a private automobile. And you're relying again on the, the, the definition of a, of a personal family motor vehicle being used in a private setting so that the only authority that the UCC covers is if a motor vehicle is being used for a commercial purpose. So if you use a self-propelled conveyance okay. on the public way for a profit or a gain, then you are subject to what the motor vehicle, the body, you have a license, right. and, and so they have jurisdiction, but, you're but they have no jurisdiction over me. So any personal, any individual or sovereign, if they wish to get from point A to B in a motor vehicle, then your argument is that the, the state does not have authority over that person because it's for private use that they're going from point A to point B? Yeah, they want to church on Sunday, they want to get the room. No, they want to go take a little ride up the highway to see the, the changing of the foliage in the fall. That is all personal. You do not need a license because you're not in commercial use of the highway, and you don't have to have a registration. And can you because UCC, which in the answer is RSA 382A, you see it in front of you, the Supreme Court case. It's consumer goods. Consumer goods do not require any registration. So consumer goods do not require a license to control them. How do you reconcile your argument with the state of New Hampshire law that says a person does have to have a license to drive a motor vehicle. You're talking about commercial vehicles versus the pleasure vehicle. It does not. It's not a vehicle, it's an automobile. So you're playing word games, I believe, if you excuse my expression here. You're talking semantic subterfuge. And that's the vision of syntax. I'm just trying to understand your argument, Mr. Marvel. I really am just trying to. You don't agree with that? Well, I, I'm trying to learn what your argument is. I'm not making a ruling today one way or the other. That's why we're having this discussion, so that I can fully understand what your position is and give the state an opportunity to respond as well. So let me just see if I understand it. Government is a corporation. They have no, they, they make public policy, but that is not enforceable to the individual sovereign. If someone is using a motor vehicle to travel for a personal reason, you just lose the term. Excuse me for interrupting you. You keep okay. using the term motor vehicle. The self we have two self-propelled. What did you call it? A self-propelled. I wrote down that because I understand that you don't want to. If someone is using some sort of mode of transportation that they're in control of, and by in control of, I mean they're pushing the gas pedal, they're driving it, they're making decisions to turn right or left. Your argument is, if they're doing that in their personal life, that they do not need a driver's license. But if they were doing that, say, to sell their goods to Shaw's supermarket, or to go build a house so they were a contractor, they would need a driver's license. Am I understanding the distinction that you're making? You use the word license, and you know that a license is something that government gives you a privilege, a convert, a right into a privilege. That's because Murdoch versus Pennsylvania prohibits that. You cannot, you cannot license a right and charge a fee for it. Because the right to travel existed before governments were created. The courts have all already adjudicated it. But because of deprivation of information, because of deprivation of information, the people are coerced into doing what the automobile dealers have acquired your certificate of origin, which is the original deed to your property, and they gave it to motor vehicle. So now the motor vehicle is a recipient 
of the fruit of an evil tree. The evil tree being the apple being the dealers who sent them the certificate of origin. The one of the father takes that. Because now they have the original deed to your property. Are you talking about the title to the property? That's the certificate of origin. Now, look, the one of the department being in business to raise revenue, they offer the, the unfortunate individual who permitted his certificate of origin to be taken from him because he didn't know. And that's silence. And that's silence by the automobile dealer. And the silence by the one vehicle department is fraud. And that has been adjudicated by the courts in the United States versus Tweel, T-W-E-E-L, and United States versus Pruden, P-R-U-D-E-N. Both of those cases apply fraud as silence. And silence I is fraud. Your position with respect to that, but how is that related to whether this court has the authority to determine whether you drove after your license was suspended. How are the licenses? I don't have a license. You can't now I suspend something that I didn't have. Now you asked me, I think it was the first encounter I had with you. Do I have a license? You know, I have a photo ID. She's got it, and I want it back. And I want my contract with the Dr. Hitchcock, which is hinged to that by, by tape. That's a contract. I've been deprived of that. That's conversion. My property which I exchanged 50 FRNs to get that photo ID. I want her to put that in front of you right now because they're using that as evidence. And that's fraudulent evidence. And when you see it, you'll know why. Would you plan to have her prosecuted to deliver that to you? Well, I don't, I mean, if that's evidence in their case, that would be something they would present at the trial, not at this motion hearing today. No, no, no. You no, have no. the right, you have the right to request copy of anything that the state is intending to present. Well, then if you, don't, if you don't want her to see, I want her to see it. Because nobody else looks at it. And that is not a contract. Because when I purchased that, and my signature, at the end of my signature, it is laminated in a plastic bin, are the characters T, D, C. T, D, C means threat, the rest of coercion. That's not a contract. Do you understand why there's no jurisdiction? There's no subject matter jurisdiction because no lawful contract. So are you saying that you were forced to obtain that document, we'll call it? Yes. And you were forced why? Pardon? How, how is it? On a threat to arrest and coercion. So the threat I'm was that if you didn't, so was the threat that if you didn't purchase that document, that you couldn't drive? Well, let's put it in uh, common law terms. Not a subset. No contract. No jurisdiction. And traffic is that is not a crime. So when I got these papers here telling me that I was criminal, that I had to, I had to bribe another corporate employee with flawed plans, so-called, to get my freedom, which you took my leave freedom and liberty from me twice. And I told you the last time, you didn't do it in accordance with Article 87, because I asked the Hooks of Police, and they did it, orchestrated it, so it was done at the polls when I was being reelected. The people recognized what was going on. The people reelected me. Why? Because they know my history is to protect them from the avarice and greed of a corporation, which is extorting their wealth from them. That's what I'm trying to do. I have a building now. It'll settle what's going on here today. Nobody else will have to go through the travail that I have been put through. Okay. At my age. All right, and Mr. Markle, I do want to give the state an opportunity to respond, but before I do that, are there any other matters or issues that you wish to bring forward to the court today? Yes. This is a stereotypic thesis supporting everything that I have said. All right, do you have a copy for the state by any chance? Pardon me? Do you have a copy to give to the other side? I gave it to you before, no, no, but you never read it. In fact, at our last meeting, you told me that you didn't read the affidavit of proof, which I submitted on September 1st. Yes, and I did tell you that because I did not see your file again until the day that you were here. And then you didn't receive the uh, 
after they were the to fall, which I issued. Right. I have no, you have a copy of that? Have you read it? I have read everything that you have submitted. Did you see? see? Can you hold on just one minute? I just want to see. Thank you. 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 Thank so that's why I'm asking the state if they have it. If they don't... That may be your rules, but I'm not subject to your rules because it's not your jurisdiction. Well, so whatever your rules, that only applies to the corporate employees, not to me. All right, now, so I would like to quote this from a very... This is the Atlantic Reporter. The Atlantic Reporter, did you say? Pardon me? Did you say the Atlantic Reporter? That's correct. Okay. I'll give you the citation. It starts on the Carmen versus Barr. Carmen versus who? November 1st, 1906. And the significance of this is in what I'm about to read now. It has been very clearly justified and forcibly observed that there is a negative fraud in the imposing a false apprehension on another by silence. Where silence is a treacherously oppressive. In equity, therefore, quote, where a man has been silent when in conscience he ought to have spoken, he shall be despised from speaking when conscience requires him to remain silent. That's taken out of another case, Harris versus America Building and So Forth Association, and that citation is 122 Atlanta, uh, Alabama, ALA, page 545. It's also recorded in 25 South on page 200. Science is a species of conduct and constitutes an implied representation of the existence of a state of facts in question. And estoppel is accordingly a species of estoppel by misrepresentation. That's uh, cited in 16 CYC, uh, page 681, at note 10. When the sciences of such character and under such circumstances that it would become a fraud upon either other party to permit the party who is kept silent to deny what his silence has induced the other to believe. Okay, Mr. Martin, can I stop you? What is the, the silence, what is the silence that you're referring to? The silence is being perpetrated by the motor vehicle department when it offers people the opportunity to, you know what? We have, I have an option. Oh, you got one? Oh, okay. Thank you. Did she want one? We, we made one for her, too. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. So the so, silence is the Department of Motor Vehicle in what way? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? You were talking about silence being fraud. Yes. And I asked what silence you were referring to when you started to say the Department of Motor Vehicle. The Department of Motor Vehicles does not give full disclosure to what they're doing when they offer the general public the opportunity to enter into a contract and purchase what is called a certificate. It is not the title, it's a certificate. And again, we're playing semantic subterfuge, word games, and I find that extremely uncomfortable. Well, I, I the public is being ripped off by millions of, I think it was 98 million last year. And when you say 98, when you're talking about the contract, and I know you don't call it a driver's license, but are you talking about that document that has numbers on it and your picture, and it says operator on it? Is that the document, the contract that you are talking about? I'm talking about what the automobile dealer manufacturers are compelled by federal law to have a deed to that property which is sold to the automobile dealer and deliver to him when the automobile is delivered. 
So don't mix up automobiles with motor vehicles. They're like a horse and a zebra. Okay, so what is the difference between a motor vehicle and an automobile then? Because maybe I am misunderstanding. A motor vehicle is a self-propelled vehicle which is used on the public way for commercial product gain or other commercial use. All right. So it is I'm not an automobile. So when you say motor vehicle, you're seeing that as not necessarily an automobile. When you say the word motor vehicle, are you talking about a horse and carriage, uh, a moped? I mean, am I, am I understanding you about that? Again, it can be simply said, the jurisdiction for the motor vehicle department is solely and exclusively commercial. It has nothing to do with what the UCC has defined, and you've got a copy of the Supreme Court decision on that, is consumer goods. So an automobile under our own statutes, which are forced to compel to obey, our statutes define an automobile as consumer goods. They're not taxable. You don't even have to register them. In fact, the legislation I propose will require the motor vehicle department to give anybody who has an automobile a, what I purchased here, but there won't be a purchase from mine, there will be an order to give the automobile owner a photo ID with UCC, what is this here? And that would permit them to? Right, they're, they're, they're identified. Right, get, a, get a copy of my proposed legislation. Did you Read it. I will. That sounds interesting. Because it's to put a stop to what I have been doing. Right. My freedom has been taken from me. My liberty has been taken from me. I have been embarrassed and humiliated in front of my constituents at the polls when an unlawful warrant was executed in contrary to Article 87 of Part 2. I think I brought that before you before. And there has to be some accountability for all this. All right, Mr. Marco, I, I do understand your argument with respect to the commercial goods and the, the uh, not it being an, each individual being an, an individual sovereign. I'm going to ask the state if there's, if there's anything you say wishes to put on the record. Just briefly, Your Honor, as best the state can respond in this juncture, uh, the state would direct the court to the New Hampshire Supreme Court case of State v. Sterin, S-T-E-R-R-I-N, as in Nancy. That can be found at 78 New Hampshire, 220. It's a 1916 case uh, where the New Hampshire State Supreme Court held that the operation of an automobile upon the public highways is not a right, but only a privilege, which the state may grant or withhold at pleasure, and that what the state may withhold, it may grant upon condition. I would also direct the court to the opinion of the justices, which can be found this particular opinion at 94 New Hampshire, 501, it's from 1947, um, that the control which the state may exercise over the use of its highways is practically unlimited, and the right to travel under the 14th Amendment does not impede the state's authority to regulate the operation of automobiles upon public ways. I would also direct the court to a U.S. Supreme Court case, Hendrick v. State of Maryland, which can be found at 235 U.S. 610. It's a 1915 case. Um, and lastly, I would indicate that um, a state may rightfully prescribe uniform regulations necessary for public safety and order in respect to the operation upon its highways of all motor vehicles and to this end, it may require the registration of such vehicles and the licensing of their drivers. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Markle, uh, any last remarks or arguments that you would like to make before we conclude? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to offer a couple of more citations All here. Right. The Rodriguez versus Ray Donovan, who happened to be the commissioner of the Department of Labor for the United States government. Uh, this was in 1985, and the citation is 769, F period 2D, page 1344, which says, and I quote, all codes, rules, and regulations are applicable to the government authorities only, not human creations in accordance with God's laws. All codes, rules, and regulations 
are unconstitutional and lack in due process, unquote. That is a prevalence of the diseases which shall be exercised. The other one is, quote, U.S. versus Cooper corporations, and that is the United States Supreme Court, volume 13, I think it was volume 318, U.S. page 600. This is in 1941. Quote, and the government admits that often the word person, quote unquote, is used in such sense as, quote, not to include the sovereign, but urges that where it, as, as in the present instance, its wider application is consistent with and tends to effectuate the public policy evidenced by the statute and the term should be held to embrace only the government. Now, that being said, I find it very interesting because it changes the difference between a person and a sovereign. The word person is a corporation. And I think I went through this before. If you look at your checkbook and you see your signature line, it's not God's, it's microprint, which says authorized signature. Look at it, in a magnification. And your name is spelled with all capital letters in the upper left-hand corner of your check. The reason is, that's your straw man, your ens leges, as I refer to, that's the Latin. And since we're talking Latin, I'm sure you had it in law school. And that's inclusio unices exclusio alternatives, which translated from Latin means that which is included absolutely excludes all others. So when the word person is used, and that is a statutory ma maximum of law that we have to use in crafting legislation. That which is included absolutely excludes all others. So I am not a person. You have no jurisdiction, either in asylum or subject matter. And I brought that up with my oath purgatory when we first encountered you didn't seem to want to accept that. That was done under 15 statutes of lives, which is federal. 15 statutes of lives, chapter 249. 249 is entitled Rights of an American Citizen. All right, and I know I appreciate your explaining that. I have a better understanding of what your position is. Uh, I'm going to take this under advisement. I do want an opportunity to review some of the cases that you have cited as well as some of the cases that the state has cited and uh, I will issue my order just as soon as I can. Thank you. All right. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.